You pick up a rock, you inspect it, streaks of this reddish yellow metal course through it. Something inside you stirs. It satisfies the primal desire to want pretty things. You've found gold. Now, alchemy is an ancient philosophy designed to simply extract, purify, and perfect certain materials. Mankind's evolution can be charted by how effectively we have used the Earth's resources. We turn wood into building materials, stone into tools, we extract metals from ores. Alchemy, in its own unique way, helped us understand the natural world around us. Nowadays, alchemy seems rather quaint and is often used to inspire works of fantasy fiction, such as Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and the Full Metal Alchemist series. J.K. Rowling used numerous alchemic influences throughout her stories and the expanded lore. The aim of the alchemist was to make the Philosopher's Stone. In addition to being able to turn lead into gold, the stone could also create multiple clone bodies, give you immortality via the elixir of life, and facilitate perpetual motion. It could even jump up and down and do a twirl. OK, I've made that last one up, but I think you get the point. The stone molds the laws of physics in your hand, the power of God in the hands of mortals, supposedly. Now, alchemists lived in an era where they understood less about the natural world than every school student here. Imagine trying to traverse an impossibly difficult labyrinth. You know there's a trick to the maze, but everything you do just doesn't work. It's like trying to run into a wall over and over again, trying to chip away at the masonry. Most never make a breakthrough. Some might do. But over the centuries, the foundation was laid for a certain philosophy. One based on hypothesis, experimentation, evaluation of results, and repetition for validation. We call this philosophy science. Now, as a 21st century chemist, I have access to centuries of work. I could Google the answer to a question I had that previously would have been locked away in a stuffy university library. Other search engines are also available. Today, we live in the golden age of health and safety and risk assessments. To give you an example of this, mercury is a highly toxic liquid that requires heavy controls and due care. In the past, it would have been drunk as a medicine. Now, as a chemist, I can look back at an alchemist and laugh, and I do. <laughs> but there is a respect that comes from understanding where we have come from. It's the chemical equivalent of understanding which mushrooms were safe to eat. So let's just think about mercury for a second. It's a liquid metal. Just picture that for a second. A liquid metal. To our ancestors and ancient philosophers, that must have been so bizarre. Liquids just aren't metal. Now, because of this, mercury was called quicksilver, because it looks like liquid silver, and is often extracted from the mineral cinnabar, a reddish salt. Because of its strange properties, mercury was attributed spiritual significance. It was claimed to be the vehicle of life. But given how toxic mercury is, it's more like the vehicle to the afterlife. But on a serious point, though, how much of human history can be mapped by a monarch or a warlord being driven mad 
by life exposed to mercury medicines or lead poisoning in the water supply. Queen Elizabeth I famously wore white lead makeup, which contributed to losing her hair and losing her teeth. It's called the Venetian curse and is one of the more plausible hypotheses surrounding her death. Now, mercury was one of the three central alchemic bases, uniting the elements of water and air. Another alchemic base was sulfur, representing the soul, uniting the elements of fire and the earth. Why? Possibly because it was found near volcanoes. Now, on a tangent, if you ever get a chance in your life, please visit Tierdi National Park in Tenerife. Inside the vast volcanic caldera, there are these yellow streaks throughout the rock face. These are sulfur deposits. It's truly stunning. Now, the final alchemic base is salt. Now, every student in this room should be able to tell you that salt is neutral and a compound. However, remember, we are dealing with an era where chemical extraction, particularly for reactive metals like sodium, was next to impossible. Salt was supposed to represent the body, uniting the elements of water and the earth, probably because of sea salt, a place where it's found, where the land meets the sea. So because humans are essentially hyper-intelligent magpies, we wanted gold. Gold was seen as a noble metal, a symbol of perfection, representing the sun. Transmutation from lead to gold was seen as the ideal process. Now, mysticism aside, can we make gold from lead? Yes, but there are a few catches. I'm afraid you can't make gold in your garden shed. Well, unless you have the ability to create and contain a supernova without obliterating the entire solar system. You see, as any GCSE student will tell you, a chemical element is defined by its proton number. A proton number cannot be changed via a simple chemical reaction. To illustrate my point, let's take the classical experiment of burning magnesium ribbon in a roaring blue flame. You produce a brilliant flash of white light and form a nice white powder afterwards. You need a supernova to make gold. Not really in the same league, are they? So the alchemists were ultimately chasing an impossible dream. And whilst that sounds tragic, they did have an unlikely but arguably more important selfless legacy. Acids. Now, aqua rega is one part hydrochloric acid, three part nitric acid, and can dissolve gold. Neat. However, today, so much of our chemical industries depend on acids to function, and we would be useless as a society without these vital materials. So every time you hear hydrochloric acid, just remember that alchemists dedicating their lives in pursuit of their glory. In the end, the alchemists did help humans progress, just not in the way they thought they would.